You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. So I think there are some some trends in the right direction, uh, but I, I'm not confident yet that we're over the hurdle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben shares the story of Roombas taking private photos inside people's homes. I look at the possibility of the federal government providing a cyber insurance backstop. And later in the show, my conversation with Betsy Cooper from the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. Our conversation centers around their recent research on diversity, equity, and inclusion. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben, we've got a a couple of uh, quick items of follow-up here before we jump into our main stories. Uh, I was contacted on Mastodon. I have to say this is our first listener communication via Mastodon. It's the future. This is where Elon (laughs) Musk is driving us. That's right. That's right. Uh, So that was kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard from Eric Wenger, who is Senior Director of Technology Policy and Global Government Affairs at Cisco, Pretty good job, Mm -hmm. I would say. (laughs) I love when we get contacted by big, important people. That's right. (laughs) So, uh, Not that all of you are not big, important people. That's right. You're all special in your own way. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Eric wrote in and said, uh, I do have concerns about the exchange with Ben on not being allowed to update uh, OS on regulated medical devices. He says, it's just wrong. (laughs) Fair enough. This is referring to uh, some uh, feedback we got from a listener on a previous show who said that one of the challenges with medical devices is that the FDA prohibits updating them um, and that if you update them, you would have to get new certification from the FDA. Uh, Eric writes in to say that that is mistaken, uh, and he included uh, a link to the FDA's uh, guidance on this, which we will include a link to. Uh, I will read just a part of that guidance that Eric highlighted here. It says, however, the majority of actions taken by manufacturers to address cybersecurity vulnerabilities and exploits referred to as cybersecurity routine updates and patches are generally considered to be a type of device enhancement for which the FDA does not require advanced notification or reporting under 21 CFR Part 806. So basically, uh, what this is saying is that you can apply patches, specifically security-related patches, and that does not require going back to the FDA for recertification. So, what do Good you to know. Of? Yeah. Um, always uh, important that listeners correct us when we're wrong. We were wrong on that one. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, uh, it's perilous when we get uh, to the edges of our own areas of expertise. Right? Yes, this is certainly uh, an example of uh, that type of subject. But I also appreciate him giving us the primary source here, yeah. which is the FDA guidance. Um, so I'm glad we're including that in the show notes. Take a look. Uh, you'll get more information from that than than you would from us. Yeah, so. I also want to emphasize that I, I this is not to say that our previous listener who wrote in was doing so in bad faith or anything like that. You know, there's there's this is complicated stuff, so it's easy to understand how someone could be mistaken or or whatever. Uh, so we're just happy to to get the uh, the straight story here and uh, hoping to have uh, Eric Wenger on the show sometime soon. Uh, to talk about some policy stuff that he's working on uh, with his colleagues there at Cisco. Fantastic. Yeah. What else do you have for us, Ben? You had a a little uh, quick story before we dive into our main story? Yeah. Uh, So while we were sleeping last night as we're recording the show, Congress released its year-end omnibus spending bill. 
Um, and as Congress uh, generally does, they tucked in a bunch of unrelated non-spending provisions because <laughs> uh, this is the end of the Congress. You kind of, this is the uh, train that's leaving the station and you want to get your luggage on the train. So one of those items is a ban on federal government employees using TikTok on their government-issued devices. Hmm. Uh, And this is becoming a trend. We've seen it happen at the state level uh, as these security risks have been uh, highlighted in in news reports about TikTok's uh, close ties to the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing it happen at the federal level. So presumably this is a a careful deal that's been worked out among House uh, Senate Republicans, uh, Senate Democrats and House Democrats, <laughs> House Republicans are not happy about this deal. Um, right. But it does mean that this is almost certainly going to pass and get signed by President Biden. So starting very shortly, uh, if you are a federal government employee or contractor, I believe it applies to contractors, um, you will not be able to have TikTok on your government-issued device. So hmm. that's pretty big news uh, coming out of Congress. Hmm. <laughs> is that the kind of thing that uh, could trigger the set of dominoes to fall? Yeah, I think so. I mean, really, Congress is trying to uh, use the power where they have it. Mm -hmm. I think it would be overreach and, frankly, probably not within Congress's powers to do a type of nationwide ban on private individuals uh, putting getting TikTok on their devices. Hmm. Um, I also think that would be politically perilous. Uh, So I think they're kind of... um, Going for the more narrow ground of uh, government-issued devices. It's where they have very clear jurisdiction and where they can have the most immediate impact. All right. Interesting. I will keep an eye on that one for sure. Well, let's jump into our main stories this week. Why don't you start things off for us? Well, it's the holiday season, and our gift to you today is we're going to talk about Roombas. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, this story is a little darker than uh, most stories about Roombas. I know Roombas. I don't have one, but I do. Ah, all right. So yes. you are a, a proud Roomba owner. <laughs> I have a. I have a. It's not actually a Roomba brand uh, robot vacuum cleaner, but I do have. Let me let me preface this by saying I have a shedding dog. So gotcha, <laughs> and that is what motivated us to get our uh, Roomba our Roomba esque robot vacuum cleaner, and it does its it does its job diligently and. Uh, you know, makes it so that it spreads out the uh, the amount of time in between when we have to do manual vacuuming of right. the main floor of our house. Shedding so. dog, especially in the the spring months when they lose that winter coat, yeah, um, that's gonna yep. that's gonna get you. So uh, <laughs> I mostly knew Roomba from great YouTube videos of cats uh, riding on top of Roombas, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you know that's that's going back decades now. <laughs> uh, which is why when I saw this story come across my timeline, it was so interesting. It's from Technology Review, and it's entitled, A Roomba Recorded a Woman on the Toilet, Mm. How Did Screenshots End Up on Facebook? Mm -hmm. And this is really a story about the chain of custody of images taken by Roombas inside people's houses. Now, some caveats here, so to speak. Mm. Uh, For one, these are not ordinary uh, Roomba customers. These are people who specifically agreed to have Roombas with cameras that are taking pictures to help improve artificial intelligence. Hmm. Uh, so you sign a waiver that says you can have this Roomba. It is going to be taking photos inside your house. When that green light is on, that means the camera is is up and running. Hmm. Uh, but I think the terms of service here, the thing that these customers signed, doesn't reveal the full extent of what happens with these images. Uh, So these images get sent to a contractor called Scale AI. It is a uh, San Francisco-based company that has employees all over the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And their job is to scan images, uh, classify images to improve artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, And so they send images to a bunch of data centers all around the world. Uh, They have some in, in South America, Uh, India, different countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these are live human beings who get access to these pictures uh, and make certain determinations about the picture. So, for instance, this object that you've encountered that we've never seen on previous footage from our Roombas is an object. And so we Mm -hmm. should train our our artificial intelligence to go around that object. Right. That's a volleyball or a (laughs) <laughs> pile of dog poop. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Let's, let's learn what to do with that. <laughs> right, right. The problem is, uh, I think the implication of the terms of service was that uh, robots or non-human beings were going to be the ones uh, surveying these images when they were sent to scale AI. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, but it's actually real human beings. And in this case, real human beings leaked or shared these images, and they ended up on Facebook, including a couple of rather intimate ones. Uh, the one mentioned in the headline about a woman on the toilet. There was one with a young boy uh, who was sprawled across the floor. Um, they are grainy shots. They're not clear photos, but mm-hmm. it certainly raises concerns about uh, the privacy risks involved with uh, Roombas here. Hmm. So what are the broader uh, implications? Because obviously the story itself only affects a small subset of people who are part of this trial run of uh, of having cameras on, on our devices. Right. For one, uh, there are a lot of home devices now that have cameras, including things like uh, Ring devices, which is – Owned by the parent company, Amazon, uh, yeah. which is also the parent company of iRobot, which makes the Roomba, or at least to the process of acquisition. Uh-huh. Um, so there's certainly that risk that uh, if, if we have these practices of misleading customers into collecting data that's going to be sent to actual human beings, sometimes of very private images, Mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to be going down a pretty slippery slope. Mm. Uh, And there's the fact that the legal system offers very little protection for this. Um, This is where you really start to notice that the federal government doesn't have any uh, comprehensive data privacy laws. We have this patchwork of laws, many of which would not apply to things like Roomba taking a picture of you on the toilet. Uh, <laughs> it's something that HIPAA wouldn't cover. It's something that right. FERPA wouldn't cover. Right. Uh, so oftentimes these <laughs> terms of service are based on state laws uh, like the uh, CCPA uh, or are modeled after laws in, in Europe on GDPR. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that just doesn't offer the type of full legal protection uh, that, that people might need to prevent these images from being spread. Uh, And then there's just the question of this chain of custody is how many of these companies farm out images to contractors around the world who are actual human beings who would have a chance to share these uh, photographs. So I think that's really uh, why this article is, is potentially concerning, even though, you know, Roombas themselves are kind of silly and I enjoy talking about them, but I think this, (laughs) uh, this certainly is, um, was an eye opening story. I do remember folks having concerns uh, when Amazon was going to purchase iRobot because the Roombas, some of the more advanced Roombas, they map out your home and they create a a model of your home, which helps them do the cleaning that they do. But the concern was now Amazon has a model of your home. Right. (laughs) Right. Not only does Amazon have it, but it's like, hmm, we uh, think that a crime might have been committed. Where can we go get a good model to figure out, you know, to gather mm-hmm. some evidence of, of what this home actually looks like and where we should, we should you know, yeah. search? All right, let's go to Amazon and get some images from the Roomba device. This also reminds me of years ago, uh, I recall a story about um, – I want to say it was it was one of the companies like Expensify, and I don't know if it was actually Expensify, but one of those companies who helps you keep track of your corporate expenses. And one of the ways you do that is you send them a photo of your receipts, and the receipts get scanned, and they get automatically entered, and it makes everything easier for everybody. And the company, uh, who may or may not have been Expensify, again, I don't remember. Um, don't sue us, Expensify. Exactly. Yeah. They, they were... Uh, they were sending these images off to the Mechanical Turk service, uh, which I can't remember who runs Mechanical Turk, but it's a service where very inexpensively you can have things sent off to people. Right. And the people actually do the work, and what you get back is however you wanted that image or or data or whatever processed. Um, and, you know, it gets sent off to folks who are in a part of the world where people are working for very little money. And so you can get the things you need done, done very inexpensively. Right. Uh, but you can see the concern here that you're sending your receipts off to what you think is an automated scanning device, but it's actually being entered by a real live human being. Right. And just like your Roomba story, there are concerns about the chain of custody and so on and so forth. And it just, the terms of service, at least in this example, just don't make clear that it's human beings who are going to review the images. Mm-hmm. The language is something like it gets sent off to be processed. And so mm-hmm. I think most of us would picture that uh, going into some, you know, machine learning uh, algorithm where 
a computer collects a bunch of images and tries to make improvements on the product. Mm -hmm. I just think it it becomes a little starker when you realize that these are pictures that actual human beings are processing, uh, and they've come from our houses. The other thing is, um, you know, iRobot claims they've really tried to anonymize the data. Even in these images, the uh, people who have been identified, their, their faces are blacked out. Um, <laughs> but not their butts on the toilet. Not the butts on the toilet, <laughs> yeah. Good, things we, good thing we don't yet have uh, butt scanning technology right. that uh, can I identify us in public. Oh, well, you could have an identifying tattoo or something like that. Exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly. Coming to a Law & Order episode. Right, you. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, they do make efforts to preserve privacy, uh, but you are going to end up in some situation where either due to human error or just the inability to filter all of these images, somebody's face is going to get released. And that's a very Mm -hmm. personal data um, that can be used for nefarious purposes, facial recognition, et cetera. And I just don't think that people who agreed to to this type of um, arrangement where Roomba is taking photos, I don't think they agreed or meaningfully agreed uh, to that type of collection. So I think Roomba uh, was kind of caught flat-footed here. They have said that they are going to discontinue their relationship with this particular contractor. But it's sort of like, (laughs) yeah, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know. How to get fired fast. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of like, soda is making me fat. I'm going to quit Coca-Cola. It's like, Mm -hmm. but I might use Pepsi. It's like— the story of this ending up on Facebook, was that basically, was that an employee doing it just for the the lols? Y- yes. Okay. That seems to be exactly what happened. Okay. So um, some human being got a hold of the image, and mm-hmm. I believe what happened is it was one of those, hey, look at this. Like, right. look what I came across in, in my line of work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, that ended up being leaked to, or somebody took a screenshot on Facebook and, and sent it to media sources. I see. Yep. Um, so, you know, I think they are going to use a different uh, contractor, but even they interviewed a, a contractor from a different company, um, and uh, I, I think one of the things that the CEO said is that human beings often share these photos with one another for legitimate purposes. You know, they'll say in their contracts, do not share these photos at all. But like, hey, Bob, uh, I'm trying to process this photo. I can't figure out what this is. Oh, Here's an email. Like that happens. They, people ask each other for help. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that's very hard to control internally. Mm-hmm. Uh, so watch out for those Roombas. <laughs> now, now, let's not begrudge the poor Roomba who's just doing their day-to-day work, the the unglamorous work of keeping our homes Clear of pet hair and dust and things like that. Those poor That's true. They're those so little cute robots. Too. They are cute. Yes, I a know. friend of mine. I, but my the first friend I I had who got a Roomba when they were new. I said, "So how's the Roomba?" He said, "I love it." I said, "So does it save you time?" He said, "Absolutely not." <laughs> I said, "Why?" He said, "Because I spend all my time watching the Roomba." <laughs> right. Exactly. At least you don't have to physically vacuum. But right. like, right? <laughs> I've seen them in houses. They are mesmerizing, and yeah. like their yeah. ability to find the mess in a given room is really impressive. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who frequently glosses over where all the crumbs are in my own living room, <laughs> you know, I'm glad we have this level of artificial intelligence. I just think, hopefully. From a chain of custody perspective, we don't end up in a situation where uh, these images are being sent to to human beings who might share them with one another. Yeah, we've put googly eyes on our Roomba, and oh, that's uh, such a good idea. <laughs> we're very and it's very sad because sometimes the Roomba gets stuck under something, and you feel and I just <laughs> see those little fi- yeah, fish eyes. Right, going, like Whoa. one eye is poking out, saying "Why me?" And so you bring it out, and you say, "Oh, poor Roomba, let me take you back to your charger." It's a and- great prank you can <laughs> play on your significant other is. You can buy those uh, googly eyes at a dollar store and just mm-hmm. put them on everything, oh, including yeah. in your refrigerator mm-hmm. and uh, low stakes prank. Uh, mm-hmm. So just a, a little advice from the two of us. Yeah, yeah. Still on your first marriage, aren't you, Ben? So far, yes. <laughs> we'll see what happens after I put googly eyes on on uh, everything in my house. That's right. That's right. All right. Good stuff. Uh, and we will have a link to that story in the show notes for sure. Uh, my story this week comes from the folks over at Bloomberg Law. Uh, And this is about, uh, this is written by Daphne Zhang, 
and it's titled, As Cyber Insurance Dries Up, Treasury Department Eyes a Backstop. Now, Ben, I'm going to go and say... I called it. Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) Dave was right. I have been beating this drum, or I guess I've been asking this question probably as long as we've been doing this show. I've been making the case, wondering, are we going to come to the point with cyber insurance where it ends up like flood insurance, where it's a sucker bet for the insurance companies? They get out of the business because nobody can make money doing it, and it, it, it becomes only the federal government who provides... Cyber insurance. And the answer to your question is yes, according to this article. <laughs> There's, well, yes, maybe. Um, right. At so, least they're looking into it. That's right. That's right. So uh, the, uh, the Treasury Department uh, is asking for uh, or was asking for public comment uh, on whether the government needs to shore up the insurance industry because we've seen uh, losses, of course, have gone through the roof for these insurance companies. Uh, big insurers like Lloyd's of London, the usual suspects who will insure anything if the price is right, are saying, yeah, this bum, cyber, bum, bum, bum. Yeah. <laughs> right, cyber uh, the losses are too big. Like they, are, they are catastrophic losses uh, on par with things like natural disasters and fires and floods and those sorts of things. So uh, they're inquiring as to whether or not uh, things that are uninsurable losses should be backed up by the federal government. And I, I, as I, I, I don't mean to, uh, to beat my chest here, but I, also, I mean, it didn't take a genius to see that this was, could be the way that it was going. It's right. pretty obvious. So. I mean, we've been seeing for a while that these insurance companies are losing, you know, their yeah. losses are reaching 300%, 400%. Uh, it's a model that was increasingly uh, unsustainable mm-hmm. because there are so many cyber attacks. Um, the underwriting process can't keep up with the level of risk that exists uh, in the cyber realm. And then you get into this death spiral where insurance companies pull pull out of the market because mm-hmm. it's too expensive. And then all of the risk gets passed on to consumers. Um, and that's not good for anyone. Yeah. So. I think the idea here, as we've done with flood insurance, is to pass off some of the risk to the government. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not the only—flood insurance isn't the only example of this. I mean, even something like the FDIC, uh, it's federal—it's the federal government backstopping our financial system in case the private sector fails. Uh, But it's not a great solution, as we've seen with flood insurance. No, flood insurance is— Crappy insurance. I yeah, mean. <laughs> it's it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the system has ha, does not work well, and people who've relied on it after major flooding events always end up disappointed. Yeah. Um. But but uh, the flip side of that does it does it incentivize people to not build in flood zones, knowing that they can't get good insurance. I don't know. I, I mean, do we have any reliable data on that? Not mm. that I've seen. Yeah. I think people just don't make decisions with those precise level of risk calculations. Yeah. I mean— People love the water. Yeah, everybody's moving to Florida, so mm-hmm. they're it's seemingly uh, that risk is not being priced in. Yeah. I think this is sort of a carrots and sticks approach that the government would be taking where mm-hmm. we'll backstop um, your insurance policies— uh, but you have to comply with certain federally mandated cybersecurity standards. Right. So whether that's the NIST framework or um, whatever they come up with uh, in the years ahead. And I think the private sector is saying, well, you know, that might be over uh, overly restrictive. Companies should be given the freedom to offer uh, policies on their own terms. Uh, let, let us underwrite it. Um, we'll have more innovation in the industry. Uh, you know, don't slap a bunch of mandates on it, which, yeah. which is all well and good until they're losing so much money that they drop out of the market and consumers are left footing the bill. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's no easy answer here. I think it's good that the federal government is is looking into this. It looks like the comment period has ended. Yeah. Um, but I'm very curious to see uh, what comes of this. And th- this article points out that if we do get a national cyber insurance policy, that it may very well limit uh, coverage to things that qualify as critical infrastructure. Right. Um, which makes sense. 
Um, but you could see a whole lot of people scrambling to say, we're critical infrastructure. We're, we're critical. Yeah, it's going to be fun please, for the lobbyists. Please. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. toy store on the mall is critical infrastructure, okay? <laughs> That's right. Um, Especially this time of year. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be somewhat limiting. And that also doesn't – I mean, there are companies that clearly don't qualify um, as critical infrastructure. But they're still – things that people rely on. There's still businesses that help power our economy. And we don't want to get into a situation where there's no option uh, for cyber insurance for those mm-hmm. types of companies. So that would be my significant uh, concern here. But the current system is unsustainable. Uh, the premiums have uh, – one of the, the stats that jumped out at me here is that cyber premiums jumped 95% in 2021. Yeah, That's just commensurate with the increased level of risk. They're just – the underwriters aren't able to process the risk quickly enough. Mm-hmm. And so even despite these skyrocketing premiums, they're still losing money. Mm-hmm. Um, so something has to be done. Whether it's this solution uh, or another solution, um, the status quo is unsustainable. When, if you'll allow me a bit of speculative snark here, uh, <laughs> it's just one of my specialties. Um, This article points out that more and more cyber insurance policies are excluding attacks from nation state actors, right? Right. And we have certainly witnessed that one of the common responses when an organization is attacked is for them to say, we were attacked by sophisticated nation state actors. What could we do? They throw up their hands. Right. There's nothing we could have done here. I wonder how these two things are going to intersect. Are we going – it, it, so in order to get their insurance coverage, are we going to see organizations saying, we were attacked by script kiddies who yeah. barely knew what they were doing. <laughs> it's clear. This was clearly someone from down the street working in, in their parents' basement. <laughs> Maybe it just depends on who's listening. You go – for insurance purposes, you say – we were attacked by the kid in his basement. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for public relations purposes, you say we were attacked by a sophisticated nation state. And I just hope, you know, people don't see uh, the two statements uh, together at any given time. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we will have a link to uh, this story in our show notes. And, of course, we would love to hear from you. Our email address is caveat at the cyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Betsy Cooper from the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. Our conversation centered around their recent research on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Here's my conversation with Betsy Cooper. First, um, as an organization, uh, the Aspen Tech Policy Hub and the umbrella we're a part of Aspen Digital care deeply about diversity and equity and inclusion issues and had begun of our own accord incorporating certain techniques to try to encourage that in our own hiring and and internal processes. So for instance, uh, we have rules about how we pay speakers to ensure that everybody is treated equitably and that we're not taking away their time for free. Or we will uh, incorporate certain processes like anonymous review when we're hiring people. And so we got to talking and thinking about, well, there must be other best practices to encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion. And 
we're, you know, just this one little organization, maybe we should get a bunch of smart people together and see what they think would matter and uh, how, how they would care about those issues. And then the second motivating factor uh, was uh, the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, so at the time, uh, the program officer, Eli Sugarman, also cared deeply about these issues. And so we got into a chat with him about this. And he said, you know, it'd be great to do a couple round tables with really smart people think, you know, high level executives who might not be thinking about this as well as people in the field uh, who come from diverse backgrounds and talk about their experiences. So we can see if we can come up with some simple tips that people can take forward or some ideas that uh, funders can actually invest in for the future. And we said, sign us up. And, uh, and so the project was born. Well, let's go through some of the key findings here. I mean, what are some of the things that uh, rose to the top for you? Well, so first we have a lot of work to do. I think, uh, you know, some of the data is incredibly stark. I mean, that only 4% of workers self-identify as Hispanic, 24% as women. Like these are not good numbers, not representative of our community. And then a lot of the stories that you hear are also people who enter the field and then depart because they don't feel comfortable in that space. So, so I think, you know, I, I'd hoped it would be a bit more of a happy ending story, but I think the lesson really was that there's a lot more work to do. Um, I think we came up with some interesting ideas uh, for uh, steps, uh, sort of bigger picture steps that could be taken. Um, so things like organizing a coalition to think about certifications for cybersecurity jobs, um, collecting and sharing anonymous data among organizations, especially private sector organizations, to share characteristics that can give you an idea about successful hiring for cybersecurity jobs. So, you know, if you're hiring people who don't have a traditional background in cybersecurity, what are you seeing that is leading them to be successful? And can we share that information among ourselves? Um, another one, especially applicable in the federal space, uh, whether the current criminal background check process is working. Um, a lot of uh, candidates uh, may be targeted uh, by police unfairly, may have some form of a record, and that can eliminate them from all sorts of jobs, federal and sometimes private sector as well. So, so these were the sorts of ideas, uh, trying to develop coalitions to actually get information sharing happening so that we can make progress on these issues. You know, I, I hear a lot of folks when talking about this uh, point out, and I think, you know, perhaps trying to find some good news that the numbers may be trending in the right direction, that you know, more women are being hired and that um, some of these are improving. Is, does that track with the, the sort of things that you gathered here or, or not? So we didn't run trend lines, so I can't say for sure. I do know that on women, the numbers are better than they were uh, years ago because I did a report, I think, back in 2017. So the trend mm. line, at least in female hiring, is better. I also am seeing uh, more companies at least giving uh, lip service to the idea that they care about these issues, and that's obviously not enough, but that's at least an improvement from years ago in which there was sort of a coded uh, impression that actually hiring someone who is different from the rest of the team might actually harm the team's chemistry in some way and lead to negative results. So so at least we're not hearing that sort of explicit bias uh, come out on a regular basis anymore. But I do think that uh, on the other hand, we're seeing that you know the cyber talent pipeline is incredibly uh, under-resourced to begin with. Uh, Craig Newmark um, has been doing a lot of interesting work in this space. And then when you add the diversity, equity, and inclusion layer on top of it, it gets even harder. If you don't have enough people to begin with, and now you're trying to grow the field uh, to represent more of what America looks like rather than the existing cybersecurity field, it's a real challenge. So I think there are some some trends in the right direction, uh, but I, I, I'm not confident yet that that we're over the hurdle. I know you're tracking some some real world trends and and things that are going on. I believe in in the government space. Can you can you share with us what you're seeing there? Yeah, so I think there's been some interesting innovations uh, happening in government, and then some actual uh, pushback on those, which I think get, can give you some color as to exactly what we're facing. So the Department mm -hmm. of Homeland Security, uh, I believe it was last year, came up with an interesting program in which they, and I, I believe I saw they invested seven years researching this, so long after I left uh, the department, uh, 
But so they invested a ton of time into coming up with a new personnel management system for cybersecurity and essentially coming up with new hiring authorities and ability to pay closer, not up to, but closer to market rates so that they would be more competitive. And so this sounds on its face like a huge victory, like, you know, DHS is an incredibly important cybersecurity uh, partner and the fact that they can hire more people uh, seems like it should be a good thing. But apparently um, the uh, director of the Office of Personnel Management has been getting a lot of pushback uh, from uh, other agencies about this being allowed, that uh, the other agencies are saying now DHS is able to hire away not just private sector people, but other federal employees doing cybersecurity and other agencies because now DHS can pay more. Um, So it's one of those holistic questions. Um, You know, I support the opportunity of DHS to do better in this space. And I do think that given that they house CISA, there should be some priority given to the to the work that they're doing. But sometimes uh, because government operates in silos, there's nobody in position to sort of see the overarching picture and to predict the pushback that might happen or the effects that might occur on other agencies if the salary is at DHS Dis, are disproportionate to others. So, so I think that's one key reason why the coalitions I was mentioning earlier are so important is that you need both a variety of stakeholders and folks from outside, uh, you know, like uh, some of my Aspen Institute colleagues to come in and see these opportunities and maybe give you a little bit of red teaming on these ideas to help identify some of the challenges that might come up before they happen, rather as in this case with OPM after the fact. How about some actionable items? I mean, based on the information that you will have gathered, if I'm part of a hiring team at my organization, uh, how do I do my part to make sure that uh, we're including people who deserve a look? Yeah, so um, some of the things that we do um, uh, that are really important. So first, uh, anonymous review of uh, job applications. So look at the cover letter before you look at the resume. Um, or uh, sometimes we use uh, tests that are basically you do it anonymously so that you're able to see the person's quality. Um, we are human. So if you see someone with a particular academic background that speaks to you or a specific set of credentials, you might read the rest of that application unthinkingly with, you know, with an expectation of whether that person is strong or not. Uh, we do this in our own Aspen Tech Policy Hub fellowships, for instance, and it's amazing how often in the anonymous review, I will pick the community college grad over the Harvard grad if I do it anonymously, but might come out the other way if I had read the resume first. Then second, I think it's really important to keep job postings open until a diverse slate of candidates have applied. So don't jump right to the first applicants that you get. Um, You have to look at your uh, marketing strategies. Are you marketing only to elite universities um, or places that do not generate diverse talent? If so, you might want to reconsider that. Um, At the interview stage, we incorporate what we call the modified Rooney rule, uh, sort of borrowing from uh, the NFL. Uh, And this has flaws. um, So I want to state this up front that this is not everything, but we do always ensure that we have at least one uh, person who does not identify as male and one person of color interview for every position. Um, And and I think the folks that we hire and the folks that are in our fellowship uh, reflect that uh, really well. Um, and then uh, finally, you have to be willing to have uh, conversations around these things. So one of the easiest places to do that is on referrals. So how often do you get a candidate that somebody emails you about and you give them an exceptional look um, or maybe bump them through because your friend asked you to look at them carefully? So we don't take referrals, and the only time we will look at a referral is as a tiebreaker once that person is already at the final stage of hiring. If we have two candidates and they're identical otherwise, we might look at a referral at that stage, but we don't let them affect the early uh, review of our candidates. So, so having conversations around DEI, around some of the practices you might be deploying that are leading you to get candidates that always look the same, uh, some of these tips hopefully can lead you to do a little bit better and then to have a conversation around taking even more serious steps to encourage DEI within your company. 
And then the last thing I want to say is that it's not just about the supply of candidates. It's also about the demand um, and the demand from your company to want that diversity in your organization. So one reason that companies end up losing people is because they don't feel valued once they're in the organization. So they feel like they were hired to tick a box and not actually valued for their skill set. So that really involves having a, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion built into all sorts of things. What trainings are you providing? You know, in your all hands, are you talking about these questions? Are you taking on difficult issues when they arise or are you suppressing them? So, so creating that environment will lead you to have success in retaining the people you do hire. And then hopefully that will lead to more uh, diverse candidates being interested in joining you. Ben, what do you think? This is really music to my ears. I mean, I've tried to make uh, a career out of this where you bring <laughs> together policy experts and cyber practitioners in the same room so that we can just talk to one another. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think uh, we're so blind to uh, the issues on the other side of the ledger. And so getting this type of group where practitioners can not only learn about public policy, but also best practices and in private industry um, is really going to be beneficial Uh and I, I think the uh, we, we should really go the other way where there's some type of, of group out there for us policy nerds to get a 101 in uh, the technical issues with, with cybersecurity. Mm. Um, and, you know, my institution at the University of Maryland uh, School of Law, we've, tr- we've tried to do that by having a cyber boot camp course where people learn about cybersecurity uh, in a managed one-week course, uh, kind of a crash course in the technological issues. But hmm. um, that's why this was kind of uh, an encouraging interview to, to hear that um, there's a broader effort out there to bring these two communities together. Yeah. Well, our thanks to uh, Betsy Cooper from the Aspen Tech Policy Hub for taking the time and sharing her expertise with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.